You're listening to the Viral Folly Podcast Podcast. Now here's your host, Rob, on the mic. Hey, good day, everyone. I'm Robin Sparrow for the Viral Volley Podcast, and this is College Volleyball Weekly, the men's edition. Dave Hunt of Pepperdine, Dan Finn of Lewis, Jay Hasek of George Mason. Uh, after week nine action, we've got so many good things going on, and, and the, the things are really beginning to shake out. But as we've been doing since the beginning, we have the COVID scorecard, and unfortunately, it reared its ugly head again in Jay's conference at EIVA. Uh, two matches are effective. Uh, that was Penn State at St. Francis. So, and if you're in our volleyballmag.com uh, segment, uh, they may or may not reschedule that depending on gym time and the availability of facilities. So that uh, makes sense being that, well, actually, maybe not. I don't know what they're doing basketball wise at those two universities, but I know our team's out of it. So we'd be able to reschedule. <laughs> but uh, hey, uh, welcome back, gentlemen, and thanks for coming back on. I'm going to start off with the uh, AVCA poll that just came out yesterday. Uh, thoughts on it? We're going to start with uh, Jay this time on the uh, East Coast. Do you think that accurately reflects what's going on? Because we know this is such a hot topic this season. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think, again, you, you've got some coaches around the country that are giving some priority to teams that are playing versus ones that still haven't played. I mean, let's be honest. It's, it's the middle of March, going to be the latter part of March, and Long Beach and Northridge still haven't played yet. Uh, and I know, you know, Long Beach obviously is a historically strong program. And once they start playing, we'll get a little bit of eyes on them and see what kind of where they fall in the mix. But I mean, I, 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 I didn't rank them again this week. I just, I can't give somebody preference when they haven't played when I've got other teams that do. And so, you know, some coaches do give them, you know, rankings and that's fine. That's their choice. I think the real thing again is, is it consistent? Are you consistent throughout the weeks in what you're doing? And so, you know, this week, probably be the last time that you don't see Long Beach on my list. But you never know. I mean, there might be some fantastic performances from other places that, you know, you just you, you got to give them a little love. All right. How about you, Dave? Yeah, I'm I'm right up there with Jay. I mean, it, at some point we're in March, right? March 16th and somebody hasn't played and you're still ranking somebody in the top 10. It's uh, it's a slap in the face to the teams that have played. Again, it's no knock on Alan, his program, the talent that's in his program. I'm with Jay. As soon as they get on the court. Yeah, they're probably going to get some some credit from me, but it's just, come on. Yeah, it's sort of irritating, but that's just my own opinion. <laughs> and then finally, how about you, Dan? Thoughts on that ABCA poll? Yeah, I, I think it reflects what, what most of the coaches have been doing consistent if you go through and look at it. Certainly there's a couple obscure votes here and there on some things, but those, not so as coaches' opinions. But it's interesting, like, it's the hardest poll to do because you don't have these non-conference games and – you're just playing within your conference and then you're going to, you know, some people are going to be like, well, the West coast is way stronger or, Hey, why is NGIT in there? Well, NGIT is good and Penn state are good. You know what I mean? And they deserve some credit this year. Do you know what I mean? In terms of at the same time, Irvine and San Diego are, are great. I'm not sure their record. Is One in five, both teams. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I mean. I'm not sure their record necessarily reflects the talent that they have on the team. But we both know when we watched them the very first time, setters were a problem, but they hadn't played very many matches. Now they've played some more matches and starting to look a little bit better. And that's all part of this. So I think all those teams that are kind of ranked anywhere between two and about 13, 14, almost could switch at any time. There, there's a lot of, a lot of talent across those teams. And there's an interesting fan question that talks about seniors and not playing young guys that we'll have later on. It's kind of like, uh, well, that's why there's so much uh, prosperity in terms of all those teams right there. Do you know what I mean? Able to do. So, yeah. well, the biggest jump of the week was uh, UCLA number six from number eight, since they upset a certain coach's team on the screen and uh, on the West coast. <laughs> but uh, the biggest fall ironically was McKendry from eight, uh, six to eight, because they got beaten by another coach on this screen. So uh um, interesting how volatile it is right now, which reflects a lot, everything that you guys have been saying, particularly Dan. So um, speaking of coaches. Said, you just made a comment that that was a fall. That's two spots. I, I know. I, I, well, you know we're, we're I, the bigger dramatic. one to point out is how I help people and Dan hurts people. Exactly. Really that. yeah, well, that's, about, yeah, just that's, that's been the case for a long time. When I was at Penn no, State, we would, we would constantly be in the 10, 11, 12 range. And we would end up beating a team from the West Coast and we get bumped up once. 
but then we would lose to a team, ran a random team for the West Coast, and we'd lose four spots. I mean, it's just yeah. it's ridiculous how that stuff all works. There's no real consistency back in the day, and I think nowadays when you got these these coaches from everywhere else that see and take it seriously, I think you're seeing a little bit more consistency. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of coaches, uh, one of our coaches hit a milestone here. That's Dan, friend of Lewis, 400th win, taking out, I guess, a friend, mentor, mentee with Nikki Sandlin on a Thursday night, which is the, the big dis- discussion topic between our email thread, because I think he's back on the road to coach of the year status, but uh, we'll, we'll see how the rest of the season goes for Dan. But- do I get do I get a Miva coach's vote? Because I was making that push. <laughs> We got a lot of volleyball left to play, so we'll see where we're at. Right, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just giving the people what they want, Dan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Dan! Awesome Thank accomplishment. So it just means I've been around long enough, I guess. Too. <laughs> That's well, a good. Is thing. that? Oh, this is a legitimate question. Is that total head coaching wins, or is that only NCA coaching wins? No, so I, the, my SID said I'm seven wins away from 500. That's just men's wins. So. Wow. So, well, it's a uh, major milestone nonetheless. And I mean, talk about a big match. McKendry was undefeated in conference play until that evening. And your guys came out really strong. And I, I wanted to, since we're transitioning into that, you know, that was a, all eyes were on that match in the MIVA. Uh, what did you get you guys to do after you know, the loss was a week and a half ago uh, to the same team? Well, I think we're just trying to get a little better each week. You know, we lost a couple of weeks ago and then uh, had ball state after that and, uh, we're just trying to work through some things. We've, we've moved a guy to the right side who's done some nice things for us in terms of solidifying what we need to do lineup wise. And, uh, you know, the guys are just working to get a little bit better. And so I think we've got a good groove right now, but certainly we're just going to, like everybody else on this screen, we're just trying to get a little better each week and uh, put ourselves in a good spot. And I know the guys were motivated, uh, you know, to keep their shot at winning league. And that's kind of, that was a big game to do that. So good stuff. Well, can you know what it really was? Yeah. Dan was just doing that coaching thing, you know, just yeah. kind of going in, looking like he's coaching some stuff and just letting it go. That's how he's doing it. You mean rubbing First the he has the coffee, then he does the things. <laughs> he does the things. That's nice. Well, congratulations on the last 400 wins, and it's great to be able to see that and watch that match and, and see your guys bounce back from uh, last week. So uh, let's go to our conference conference rundowns. We start with Conference Carolina. Uh, first place, Mount Olive, eight and two, but a team that's hot on their tails, NGU or North Greenville University, five match winning streak. They play Limestone this week and can pull in the first with a win or a tie, uh, first place tie with a win. So uh, that's what's happening on Conference Carolina's EIVA. We're going to go to Jay. And uh, right now, NGIT, NGIT, alone at the top with an 11 and one record. And the only reason why Penn State's not tied up with them because they lost those two matches against St. Francis due to COVID. So uh, things are heating up in the IVA at the top there. Uh, your thoughts, Jay? Well, you know, and we and we lost two matches earlier in the year as well uh, to Sacred Heart because uh, they had some COVID issues when we were on our way up there. So there's been a, a couple of instances where that's come into play. And, and unfortunately, we were unable to schedule open weeks to be able to, to create um, match weekends or makeups for those uh, for those missed matches. So. You know, Penn State and St. Francis are in a little bit easier time. They're only about 45 minutes away from each other. And, you know, both those coaches might be able to work something out midweek and, and be able to, to get those matches made up. But on the whole, that could really come into play when it comes down to playoff time, because if you don't have the requisite number, you know, to be higher in the standings and it's due to COVID, there's nothing you can do about it unless you can make those matches up. So pretty tough. Yeah. Jay, are you guys doing total wins? Is that what? Declare yeah, it, it's total wins, but it's also win percentage. But even then, the win percentage, if you're playing against a team that on paper, you know, you should win both matches, you lose that opportunity to get those that percentage. So I, I think it's kind of six of one, half dozen of another. And, you know, again, playoffs are playoffs and everybody wants to host. And I think the real challenge is between four, five and five, six. Those are the ones that are really going to hurt the most because you could be hosting one week and then the next week you're not hosting anymore because somebody else no. got more matches. So that's the no. challenge. Yeah. Anything to add gentlemen to the EIVA rundown? No, just Jay talked about it earlier, NGIT and Penn state play and NGIT is at home. So it's like they could separate themselves from the pack even more in terms of uh, if we're able to secure those two ends and correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but winner of the regular season gets the host, right. In terms of the tournament. Is that, yeah. All- is that because you're taking six teams? So is that just the final four in the quarters of the week before? Or is that all three rounds? 
Yeah, so if you're EIVA savvy, you'll know from over the years, EIVA only took the top four teams in recent years' uh, history with uh, playoffs. And yes, the top team in the regular season will host the playoffs. This year, we went to six. The first two teams get a bye, and the number one team gets to host the semifinals and the finals. The two quarterfinal matches between three and six and four and five are hosted by the higher seed uh, in those matches. And so uh, it's really good that we expanded. I mean, I think this year was a, was a good case to start it. I think it should have been done years ago, but who cares? It's like this moving forward. And I think everybody really likes it. It gives them a chance to you know have an off weekend or two and not feel like they're losing anything. Yep. Well, let's jump over to uh, Dan's home conference, the MEVA. Uh, right now, uh, McKendry in first at seven and one after a loss to a Lewis University uh, Friday night and Lewis hot on their tail, six and two on a three match winning streak. Dan, talk to us what's going on in the Miva. Yeah, we're going into the second half. Uh, everybody completed their travel partner and Loyola got Loyola got a little revenge on Purdue. Ball State got a little revenge on Ohio State. Unfortunately, I think. Jacob Pasteur for Ohio State might have gone down with a, an ankle injury. Um, no. That could change some things there. Um, and so you get into this second half of conference, and uh, there's a lot of bottleneck stuff in the middle, and five and three, or three and five, and four and four. And certainly McKendry's kind of separated themselves uh, to a point, but they got to go to Loyola. Uh, they got to play Ball State at home, and they got to go to Purdue Fort Wayne. So they've got some tough matches that are coming up, and how do they respond? And all of those teams we just talked about are all in that mix uh, in yeah. terms of that. And so uh, that'll be an important piece uh, to kind of see how things go through this second half and keep our fingers crossed. We keep COVID away. You know what I mean? yeah. Well, it's Loyola and Ball State at five and three, Ohio State at four and four. So that mid, that mid section of your conference is going to be pretty meaty. Uh, yeah. We'll be fun to watch. Uh, anything to add on the Miva from an outsider perspective, Jay or Dan or Dave? <laughs> I, I think you hit it right on the head and don't forget about Purdue Fort Wayne. They're at three and five and they're not far behind. And there's, yeah. I think what four matches left in or five matches left maximum. So there, there can yeah. be some wiggle room. And, and again, it's for hosting the first round. So hopefully, um, you know, those are, those are uh, matches that they can handle. And, and there might be some shuffling. You might see, you might see Loyola go from third place down to sixth place or seventh place real fast if they don't have a good couple of weeks. So, uh, and, and you might see PFW move up. Yep. All right. Let's go over to the MPSF, uh, Dave's home conference. Uh, BYU first at 10 and 2. UCLA in second, just by nature of amount of wins, 9 and 4. Pep third, 8 and 3. And Grand Canyon, shockingly, at 2 and 4. Uh, what's happening out there in the MPSF? Yeah. It, I look at the original coaches' votes, um, and it's, it's pretty reflective of the coaches' votes. BYU. Uh, was it voted for first place? You know, they have a lot of veteran guys, obviously. And uh, and then us, UCLA and GCU were all voted pretty close. And I think that's what you're going to see in the next few weeks as GCU gets more matches. Um, as UCLA takes a little bit of time off, I think this is finals week for the UC, so they won't play. Um, so I think you're going to see those things balance out. And then uh, the big question mark is Stanford as they start to iron out some lineups, you know, they're going to win some matches. They have some really good pieces. So um how does that come into play as they start, you know, potentially looking at or concluding their final year? So I expect them to win some big ones. Is the MPSF taking all seven teams in the playoffs? The MPSF is taking all seven teams. So we're all going to Provo. Uh, we're going Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, the first place team will get a bye that first night and then we'll, we'll go from there. So you got to be good at the end. You got to probably most of the teams will be playing three straight. So you got to figure that out. Um, I would have so. given the uh, standings in the conference, but there's one and O and O and one since all the matches have been played so far, a majority have been non-conference matches in the big West. So, but they'll be seeing each other again. Um, non-conference yeah, matches within the conference. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> Well, I, you know, I wanted to go back to the MPSF stuff, but Grand Canyon can play spoiler maker in the next, next two weeks. They've got a total of six matches, which you alluded to in the volleyballmag.com segment. Uh, they play SC Wednesday, Stanford twice this weekend. Then they head over yep. to Pepperdine for three. And I yep. know a certain coach on this screen is going to be preparing really hard for that one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've 
first off, I feel bad for Worley's crew having to travel and, and do some of that. I think the SC match might be a makeup from earlier um, when SC canceled. But, yeah, they go Wednesday, and then they get on the road fri- or Thursday, play Friday, Saturday, head back home, and then they come out here, and we play some early matches. We go 3-5-5, five, and five, and, yeah, by the end of it, we'll see see what's going on. It'll be interesting to see what happens with all those matches coming Grand Canyon's way. So. Uh, yep. we'll sort things out but you know the sense i'm getting is all the conferences are pretty much going to have all their teams a majority of their teams in the playoffs so um at what point well actually we'll do a big west report and we'll talk about what the what can all pan out after the conference tournaments but uh kind of mentioned that big west conference mainly non-conference matches but the team to watch hawaii i mean against santa barbara everyone thought that was gonna be a little bit tighter of a matchup but hawaii really came out strong and you know they between Parpunov, Gasman, and Tella's doing some really good things. Cowell's making plays that are just, you know, rally changing. And uh, no one knows about Long Beach or Northridge. I mean, we still have to, to sift through a lot of things in the Big West. But outsider's perspective from the coaches and the other conferences, we'll start with you, Jay, on the Big West. Well, I, I'm interested to see what Long Beach is going to look like. You know, the, the rumor mill has been that they only have one setter in the gym, which I, I still don't believe 100%. But you know, the fact remains is that they still have some players from, from the last couple of years that are their holdovers. Uh, and they, they obviously know how to play the game at a high level and Long Beach is well trained. So I think when they start playing and they start getting into the rhythm a little bit, they're going to be an interesting team because, you know, Hawaii's good. Don't get me wrong, but there's a couple of teams that can play spoiler later on down the line. I, I still think Santa Barbara is a pretty good team. I just think they haven't found their rhythm yet. And granted they played Hawaii, who is obviously very strong. So that, that could be a starting point that might be rough for them, but Santa Barbara could be an upset team for Hawaii later on down the line. I'm just, just something about it just makes my head spin. <laughs> How about you guys on the big wets? Um, yeah, I just, Hawaii is better than everybody in the country right now. So, and then Santa Barbara is good, but I, it'll be interesting to see. I think everybody else is fighting for second. So that doesn't mean Hawaii can't, it's volleyball. Hawaii can get upset, but I think, Right now, they're above everybody and in front. Um, and it'll be interesting who finishes out second. It'll be interesting if they're good enough to get in that large if Hawaii runs the table at the conference tournament. You know what I mean? And I think those are the things that are going to roll out. And I have no idea which games count for conference and which games don't. <laughs> that makes it even more difficult because I'm like, wait, Santa Barbara beat San Diego twice. <laughs> those games don't count. What? What are we talking about? Like. So I just I don't have any ideas. Somebody needs to put a star every week so I know which games count on conference. And- <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just have to note there are only two undefeated teams in the nation, and they're out of the Big West, Hawaii. Oh, actually three if you count Northridge and Long Beach. So <laughs> any other thoughts on the Big West, Dave? You know what? It's Hawaii, I think, is playing really good volleyball. And then the tournaments in Hawaii – Right. Like you can say that, hey, they're going to get upset along the way. Chances are they probably are going to drop one or two. But I just, yeah, I don't see them losing that conference tournament at home. And then if you're the rest of the conference, does it become a bloodbath to the point where you can't get an at large because everyone beat up on each other? And um, so who knows? I mean, I don't think any of us know how any of that's going to work out. So that's just a. A side thought, but as we were talking, Jay said something that, that made me start thinking, we got to come up with a list of changes during COVID that we want to keep, right? So Jay talked about the EIVA tournament, you know, going to six, probably because of COVID and just makes sense where if there's cancellations, more teams, but, you know, I like not changing sides, you know, the fifth set, it was nice that we didn't blow the whistle and, you know, have to switch just because, so I don't know. I think we should start making a list of all these changes that, that we want to keep. I really like the five o'clock and three o'clock matches for, <laughs> for lots of reasons. For us older folks that go to bed early at night. I'll yeah. tell you what, uh, I've had a few conversations with some coaches and I think it's a pretty good idea actually that they're not switching sides. It's not affecting anything. And, and, you know, when you're playing on the beach, it makes sense. There's a good side and a bad side. There's really not a good side or a bad side in, in a college gym that you play in. And if it trickles down to club, imagine how much easier it'll be that you don't have to see the parents get up and switch sides and create all kinds of havoc in the gym when you're, when you're watching club. And I'll tell you what, we, we've already made the decision that next year our Saturday matches are going to be at five regardless. And I think that is a byproduct of us going, hey, it's nice to get home in a decent hour and actually enjoy yeah. the evening and not worry so much about, you know, eating dinner at 11 o'clock at night. So, yeah, I, I think I think if the coaches get together this summer and make some – some cross the board changes. I think it'd be just good things. Yep. 
Well, that's good stuff for uh, week nine and 10, gentlemen. Uh, but we're going to go to our quick segment here, the rundown through all our uh, fan questions. Uh, some good ones this week. May not get through all of them uh, because we do have a time constraint today. Uh, so I'm going to hit you up with the first one. Would you support changing NCAA rules to allow for more substitutions in the men's game equal to the women's game? We'll start with uh, Dave since Jay's shaking his head already. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking uh, worse things than Jay was yeah, showing, but no, <laughs> absolutely not. And I think it kills the game. I mean, collegiate women's volleyball is not resemblant of any volleyball that's played in the world. That's the reality. When people outside of our country watch NCAA volleyball, they think, what is this? And I tend to agree with them. Uh, Dan. Oh, I actually, I don't uh, want to increase subs, but I actually disagree with both these guys. It's a uh, six for one entry. So that means you can only go in one time. So I'd be okay if it was a uh, six subs unlimited. So you could go in three times or you could go in twice or something like that. It gives a little bit more movement, but not a lot more. So you're still having to teach your middles how to serve and do some things, but I could use a blocking sub twice. Uh, so it gave me a little bit more movement and we're carrying these bloated rosters of 20 to 22 guys. So there's just, you get a little bit of play, but you're not taken away from that. Hey, we only got six subs. I certainly don't want 12 or any of that stuff, but I just, if we got rid of the one entry rule or even made it a two entry rule or something, that would be the tweak that I would be okay with. Yep. So, And then to Jay. His favorite song is Controversy by Prince, by the way. <laughs> hey, how'd you know I like Prince? So uh, I, I would agree if we were to make one change because we had to, I'd be okay with dance change. Other than that, please, God, no. Please don't make it like women's volleyball. <laughs> All right, next question for you. If you're the head coach of the U.S. men's national team and you could select any three D12 players, any class, any team, Currently playing, who would they be? I feel like Dan should be the first one on this one. <laughs> okay, well, I'm taking Tyler Mitchum and Patrick Gassman right now. You know what I mean? Those are my two middles. Those guys are both beasts in the middle, you know what I mean, in terms of that. And so, uh, and then, you know, I think, well, there's some foreign guys I can't take, so I want to take any of them. No, players. no, it said anybody. It said you can take anybody. <laughs> can U.S. Take men's anybody? national team, though. <laughs> yeah, but it did it. It said you can take any division one or uh, any volleyball player. Well, I would That's probably take an American. Well, I've got those two middles. I'd probably take Rado. He's playing at a pretty high level now. You know what I mean? And so, and uh, maybe even uh, Joel from Irvine. You know what I mean? He's doing some pretty nice things at that level. Way to go over your three, Dan. Way to go over <laughs> oh, your three. I, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, three. How about you, Jay? What three or four or Lewis three? Would you go choose? And I can pick foreign players, or I can only pick American players. Well, let's let's go with uh, let's let's just open. Let's just open it up. Open. I like it. All right, I'm gonna go with Fernandez at BYU as my opposite. I think he's just a man amongst boys. Uh, I'm gonna go. I, I, I'm gonna make this call. I'm gonna go with Colton Cowell. Uh, I just think he's got a lot of ball control and a lot of savvy on the court. Um, and I and I'm gonna go. Listen, if you want to have fun. I'm going to pick Merrick McHenry, the middle from UCLA, because he's smaller and everyone around the world is going to just discount that kid until they see him jumping 13 feet. I think last time I checked, he was touching 14-6. So uh, that's the kid I'm going to pick in the middle. Wow. All right. Dave? Uh, I'm going to steal two of Dan's. I like Rado and I like uh, the middle, Gasman. Uh, I would pick Dan's other middle as well, but I got to spread it out a little bit. I don't want to get too middle heavy. Um, you know what? You know what? I take that back. I'm going to take Keenan Sanders uh, from Santa Barbara. Talk about an athletic guy. I mean, the matches before they played Hawaii, I think it was either San Diego or – I mean, they were setting that guy like 20, 25 times as a match, and he killed 16 balls. He went 16 for 20. So um, – I like what he can do. I think he's, you know, he's fast to the pins. He blocks well. He's a, uh, he's an underrated volleyball player. He doesn't get enough love for how good he is. I think. Yep. And then uh, good stuff. Final or not final second to last question. Would you support allowing Libros to serve in the men's game? We'll go with uh, Dave on this one. No. <laughs> Unless you have Gage Worsley. Yeah. I mean, our, our liberals can serve the ball real well, but. Going back to what Dan talked about it, then now 
the middles don't serve. And when I was with the women's national team, we had middles that, you know, had only served four times in their entire college career. <laughs> hey, 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 to break it to you, you got to serve in, in international competition. And, you know, a few of our middles are foot faulting at major international competitions because they just hadn't been taught to serve. And I think it's ridiculous. Yep. All right. We'll go to Jay on this one next. Hell no. <laughs> at least you're clear. <laughs> I guess there's nothing else to add beyond that. So we'll go to Dan. <laughs> no way. Not at all. No. Hey, Libros are people too. Do we have to get that trending? Libros are great. They're awesome. Yeah. But no, you don't, you're not serving. You know what I mean? So, so sorry. <laughs> We're going to end on this question because I wanted to end with a little humor. I love the way this question was asked. With so many teams playing senior citizens, and in parentheses, players a few years away from collecting their 401ks this season, many teams will be rebuilding next year. At what point does a coach start a youth movement this season? I thought this is interesting because of given our time in history, I'm like, how do you do that? Because you now have guys coming in you've recruited. You've got guys who didn't get to play last season. And then you have your guys that stayed back for the extra year. So um, we'll, we'll start with Jan this one. That's a, that's a delicate line to walk uh, because you want to be true to the guys that have been spending time with your program for the last four or five years. And you want to give them, you know, their rightful place of moving on and, and fighting for what they have. And at the same time, you're to also look at, at your young guys and going, this is a, a year that may or may not be something that we're talking about years down the line in terms of performance, but you have an opportunity to give them some experience uh, I think, you know, Stanford is probably a perfect example of this. Uh, maybe not for the young guys, for the future of the program, but for the team as a whole, uh, you give an experience to everybody. So they have a great time in, in their last year, or are you really trying to win a championship? Well, you take that and you put it into, you know, a Penn state, Ohio state, a Pepperdine, and, and they've got so many guys that are older that are playing really well, but they have a youth movement of guys that are unbelievable um, and they're, they're not getting that chance that they normally would maybe this year. And who knows where the results would be. So um, I, I don't have the perfect answer to that other than it's a real delicate line. I think it matters by team, where they are in their season and how they're finishing right now and kind of what the coach has an idea for the future. Yep. How about you, Dan? Next fall, that's when those guys are going to get touches for me. So, I mean, that's kind of – Jay brought it up, though. Like, my team's different than other teams, right? You know, we do kind of some freshman practices, but really those guys, it'll, it'll be next fall for those guys. You know what I mean? That's when they'll really start digging in their training more. Do you know what I mean? But we got a good older group and there's a couple guys that are in and out right now. And we try to do some individuals or some extra touches for those other guys in the gym when we can, but it, it's not game time. The window's pretty short right now. We're trying to be good as we can be towards the end of the season. So. Yep. All right. And we'll, we'll knock it out of the park with uh, Dave. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask because I start four freshmen and two juniors, right? So we are young. We're going to the youth movement right now. But we're not doing the youth movement out of anything, you know, philosophical or the future. It's just it's college volleyball, the best players play. And I think every coach, uh, not only on the screen, but in the country has the same vibe that, hey, you earn your time and the best players play. And, you know, if that happens to be next year, you get your shot. It's next year if it's you're improving right now and you're being not a guy then it's going to be right now but uh the better players play and with that question we conclude our episode of college volleyball weekly the men's side but I want you guys to go and support all our teams playing and if you go to volleyballmag.com's webpage they have the list of streaming as well as Vinny lopes off the block blog um go follow them watch the streams multiple screens follow them on social support uh dave hunter pepperdine Dan, friend of Lewis, and Jay Hosick of George Mason. Thank you again, gentlemen. Great stuff, as always. Look forward to, to chatting with you next week, and best of luck to you this week, and hopefully there's no more COVID con uh, cancellations. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Viral Volley Podcast podcast. Be sure to follow Rob at Rob on the Mic on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or at RobOnTheMic.com. Check you next time.